Welcome to Practical Healthy Living. I'm your host, Dr. Alan Tomala. Today, we have a really good show for you. We're joined in an extended on-topic interview with artist and author Melissa Strausser, who tells us about her art and her life's work. We also are exploring strategies for a conflict-free Thanksgiving gathering in this week's Practical Healthy Living's Tip of the Week. Finally, this week's Something Positive tells a story of adaptation to a new environment, right after this word from our sponsor. This is where I used to live near Lander, Wyoming, at the foot of the Wind River Range of the Rocky Mountains. It's a popular stop between Denver, Colorado and Yellowstone National Park. Before COVID required us to resettle to the Midwest, we used to love going out into the Wyoming wilds to shoot photos of animals and practice one of my favorite pastimes, hunting for fossils. Here's where I currently hang my hat today I thought my fossil hunting days were done, or at least put on hold for a while, but alas, the world is just as old in the Midwest as it is in Wyoming. There's just a lot more ground cover here, hiding things. Here in the city of Richmond, Indiana, near the Ohio border, is a wonderful place called Thistleweed Falls, on an offshoot of the East Branch of the Whitewater River in the Whitewater Gorge. Just beyond the falls, along the banks of the stream running through the city, one can find and observe many fossils. Many people don't notice these gems because everyone is captivated by these unique falls in the middle of town. As you search along the river banks, I think a good place to start looking for fossils are in areas where rocks have been protected for long periods of time. Like hidden by a tree's root system that's now being washed out by the current. You will have to scan over a lot of rocks, but over time you will learn to start seeing the distinct patterns that fossilized plants and animals leave behind in the stone. When the remains of a plant or an animal lay undisturbed for vast periods of time and are covered by undisturbed layers of mineral-rich soil and sediments, these minerals and enzymes start to interact with the substrate by leaching into and replacing these organic bodies with mineralized and fossilized stone. I had a student who once said that I used to like to collect the dead things, but in actuality, the animal or plant that makes up a fossil is long, long, long. What remains are patterns that tell stories about what lived and breathed long, long ago. In reality, what I collect are stories written by time. Millions of years ago, this area used to be covered by a shallow sea that was then replaced by a mile-thick glacier that started to recede and make deposits of rocks and fossils about 20,000 years ago. What remains are stories that span from millions of years ago to the present. Amid the Bryozoan we've seen today, here is a nice impression fossil of a brachiopod. All this natural history that surrounds us tells us secrets from the past. And that's something positive.
Welcome to Practical Healthy Living, Melissa. Uh, you described yourself as being raised in a family setting of Pennsylvania German art uh, folk artists, um, but you were also formally trained in London as an experimental printmaker. How would you describe Melissa Strausser art now to our audience? Hello, Alan. First of all, I'd like to thank you very much. I'm very grateful that you are having me on the program today. And Melissa Strasser art. I um, enjoy serving men and women um, a mystery in self-discovery um, with art. My art, I think, is uh, my own, uh, I'd say, eagle's eye or perspective on how I see the world and how I see other cultures. And it really has developed and I've, I've put in a lot of personal improvement and development over the years of in my practice as an artist. And I, f I feel like it, my work has evolved to being a lot about um, the, the fantasy of that, that, that folk life kind of world. And also it, it has a lot to do with intuition and memory and milestones. Okay, great. You know, be before the show came on, we were talking a little bit and I, I was telling you that we've, we've done a couple of art shows on practical healthy living, um, but sometimes people ask, well, you know, what, what is a psychology focused program uh, exploring art for? And I, I try to explain to people that, you know, art is so important to be able to express yourself when there's things that you're dealing with inside uh, and, and you're trying to get them out to be able to, to address those and look at those. And sometimes people don't have the abilities to express themselves. And we really rely on artists. Uh, so you play such an important, uh, crucial role uh, because sometimes when an artist creates something and someone looks at it and they say, yes, th this, this is how I feel. This is what I'm feeling. Uh, are, are you aware of that dynamic at all? Yes, I, I feel that my, my artwork is very expressive and it's very healing. And I very much enjoy to help men and women find their natural emotions in art. And I had an experience over the weekend that I can share with you. I, I, I donated a piece to a silent auction and um, we went along to the silent auction and it was a, a wonderful function to raise money for a, a summer, like one of the, the oldest summer theaters. And um, I, I noticed this couple kept going back to my artwork because the, the things were on display where people could, people could place their bid. And I noticed this couple and I, I went up to them on their second return to my piece. And I said, Are, would, you be, would you be interested in meeting the artist who made this piece? And their face just lit up and it was it was a magical moment for me because I um, typically I typically am very shy and I will not approach people in when they're privately in there you know enjoying something but I just thought you know I I just want to talk to these people and see and it turned out that they had come there specifically because they had seen this my artwork and it had spoke to them and it and when I when I talked to them and we shared the story behind the artwork, it was, it was as if I was, I could feel their emotions attached to my artwork. And as I walked away, I wished them the best to, you know, place their bid and they, and they did get it, but it was a wonderful exchange. And it was a wonderful, I want to say reward for me to just meet complete strangers who could have an emotional attachment to something that I made. And it's, you know, it, it is something that is, I think the arts are, are speak to people in ways that are, are so healing and, and you never really know what somebody's story is or what, or their, what their struggles that they've gone through. And when you can reach them in that way, it's really what life is all about. You kind of go from being strangers to having a very intimate experience together. That's, that's right. Now you've, you've, uh, merged the traditional with the experimental in your, in your work in a lot of ways. 
uh, what is experimental printmaking versus just regular printmaking? Um, is there a laboratory involved? Um, is, is your work a fusion of these two disciplines or uh, do you keep them separate? I love your question, Alan. Thank you so much. There should be a laboratory involved for experimental printmaking and I hope and pray someday that there will be. And I, I know of some people who are working on that side of things. Um, ex traditional printmaking for me is the foundation and the grounding. And it is, um, I think of Durr's uh, rhinoceros and I think of Goya's uh, disasters of war. And the traditional can be very rigid. It could be, um, just very stifling, I think, to to an artist. And I experimental takes that foundation into a whole different way of making art. And the art of printmaking really uh, relies on mark making and creating a mark that could just be moved around or it could just be repeated as is. And the experimental um, just really allows an artist to work in a very expressive, expressive, natural way. Uh, you've said that you you serve um, mystery and self discovery through your art. What do you mean by that, and how do you accomplish that? Well, what I mean by that is that the mystery and the self discovery is really how people can find their natural emotions in the artwork. And when, when you're making an artwork, so much of your feeling and so much of your emotion is being placed into that. And it's also the human touch. You, you know, you're, you're touching your artwork. And I was, I was actually thinking about it this morning and I was thinking, I've made several pieces that were commission based for people, but they were commission based on, they'd let, on the, where they would let, let it up to me of how I was gonna create something. And I remember when you're, when you're in those final moments of your, you're cleaning something and you're really refining it and you're finishing it and you're gonna pass it off to someone. There's that, that exchange of energy that goes, you know, it's almost like you, sometimes you miss the piece when you release it to, off to somebody, but then you find, you see the joy or you see the, the, their, their emotion. And I've had many experiences with many people to share that exchange of, uh, of, of an emotional charge that is, um, it's, it's healing for both parties, really. Uh, it appears that you've also been involved in metalworking. Can, can you describe how that has influenced your genre of work? Metalworking in comparison to printmaking is, uh, it's, I say it's spherical. So it's working in the round, it's working three-dimensional, where printmaking is two-dimensional. And the way in which I um, learned about metalworking or working in a sculptural way was when I was very young, started art school. Um, I took a, a sculptural class and we were going to weld. And I thought, my goodness, you know, this isn't really something that I, I would ever be interested in doing. This isn't something that I, I think I can do. And we were given paper to create these three-dimensional objects before we went into metal. And I worked in steel and steel is a very difficult metal to work in. And I, I actually still have that sculpture, that sculpture that I made, um, it was the best welding of the whole class. And the instructor was an Italian man. He took my hands and he said, these are the, these are the hands of a working artist. And it, and it stuck with me my whole life. And I was in awe with how, with what I did with, with welding and with metal. So it, it stayed with me for a long time. And, and it also challenged me. And the piece that I had, I, 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 I kept, I never sold it. And I placed it in my mother's garden so that it would always be there when I would visit her. And it created this incredible patina over the, over the years. And I, I have it to this day. So that's a, that's a nice, that's a nice thing. You know, I'll, I'll watch episodes of Forged in Fire and uh, it's very rarely that a, a woman will appear on that show. So I'm, I'm thinking that um, when, when you were first learning these skills, uh, you were probably 
a minority as a woman uh, doing this. Did, did you ever get any pushback for that? No, and I never really gave it too much thought because I, 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 I also went to the sculpture studio when I worked in in London and I I had ideas of how what I wanted to do and things but I like welding is a or brazing I should say it it takes um lots of practice you know lots of practice but there's something about uh, um I I feel very razor focused when I'm able to follow the light so a, a welder will follow the flame or they'll follow the light and I think that I I never really considered, you know, being a female, you know, using a welding torch. I kind of like the the rosy, the rosy of uh, of the 1960s. I I don't know. I just I it was just when I'm driven to do something. I I have that that you know, 80 percent psychology in me always working. Like I I know I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. And and my grandmother re told me, um, you know, years, years ago that she, she thought that I got the metal smithing from her father, who was a, who worked in blacksmithing and, and or it worked in iron. And I, and, you know, who knows, you know, who knows where your DNA really, really comes from or your abilities, you know, or, or that, and also that self-discovery going back to that you never really know what you're good at until you try it, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you were trained in, in England uh, in the printmaking. Um, how, how is it that a, a woman from Pennsylvania ended up in, in London? Well, I decided growing up or being raised in a family setting of folk artists, I decided I wanted to know what it would be like to be trained. I don't, I don't think any artist needs to be trained, but I wanted to know what it would be like to go to an art school. And I wanted to learn, I wanted to learn how to, to make things. And printmaking spoke to me very early on in my, in my, in my life. And when I, I, I fell in love with printmaking when I was 19 years old, because it was, it took my mind and the mind of somebody who thinks in reverse. And it said, here's a place for you. And here's a place where you can spend the rest of your life. And you never have to retire in this world of printmaking because it's going to take you forever to actually really master any of this. And I, and I was intrigued by that. So I sought after, I started to look after people like, Robert Blackburn in New York City. And then I, I, I ended up being very privileged and getting a, a full sculpture, a full sculpture, a full scholarship to go to England. And then that planted the seed in me. It planted the seed in me to find those in England because I, I felt England and Germany were the top places to learn printmaking. They were, they, they're the best printmaking. So when I received this scholarship to go to England, I started to look up people like Bartolomeo Santos and Stanley Jones. And one day, this is how this girl from Pennsylvania gets to go to England. I was applying to Pratt and Parsons and the California Institute of Art. I was applying to do a, a master's. And I my portfolio was about this big it was not anything to even for anyone to even look at and i was i didn't really have the the financial freedom to keep putting these applications out and putting them into the mail so i thought i'm done doing this because this isn't going to work so i i i quit my job that i was doing i bought an airplane ticket because i had already i had i had already completed my my first year in England and I had come back to America and I had completed my first year on the scholarship. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to quit, quit my job. I'm going to go back to England for six months and I'm going to research the best people to work with in the master to do a master's in printmaking. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do my homework. And I had a boyfriend at the time and he was very, I, I'm, to my, to this day, we're very, very good friends and he's a fountaineer. And I went back there 
And I picked up the phone one day and I called this man at University College London at the Slade School, Barto DeSantis. And I, I said that I wanted to, I wanted to pursue my, my life in printmaking and that I was visiting from America and da, da, da. He didn't even let me finish the sentence. He said, can you come and see me tomorrow at 10 o'clock? <laughs> and I went to the university at 10 o'clock that next day to see him with this little portfolio that did, really didn't mean a whole lot. And he took me up into that department and I looked around and I thought, you know what? I could see myself working here for two years. He said, you will have your own You'll have your own studio to work in. You will have all of us as professors to feed off of. And then he showed me everything. And then he, he sat me down and he looked at me and he said, I'm going to accept you on the spot. He goes, I only accept 10 people per year on our course. And he goes, but you only have, have one more obstacle to get through. And that's that you need to go back to America now and raise the money to come back and, and, and do it. And I thought, oh my goodness, I got, over the, I got over the hardest hurdle that he accepted me. But just being given that acceptance letter and, and having that was the most incredible thing in my life. It, it, really, it, really, um, it really did something for me. So I feel that, Barto, I worked with him for 17 years. I learned my craft through him. I, he was my mentor. He was my friend. He was an incredible printmaker. And I worked alongside of him later on in his life. And before he passed on, he, you know, I said to him, I had, I had changed the, the color of his, his acid. I changed it. We were, we were etching. And his acid was always this beautiful color. And there I am with my plates doing what I'm doing. And his, his acid bath had gone fluorescent green after I had placed my plates in there. And that eve, he, didn't say a, he didn't say a word. And that evening, we were going to friends of, friends of his for dinner. And he, I said to him, I, I, I said, I, I am so sorry, Barto. I said, I feel like I'm your worst nightmare. I said, I am so sorry what I did to the to the etching, your etching bath. And he looks at, and, and he said, I, I said, I must be your, your worst nightmare. And he said, darling, he said, you are the, you, you are, you are the greatest dream. He said, you created in my etching bath, something called a Dutch Morden, which is a, 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 an etching bath that is the most incredible for any etcher to work with. And at that moment in time, I felt like I was working alongside somebody and I was working alongside my mentor as opposed to, you know, working, you know, some people work, you work against things or you work, but I felt like I was just walking, I was walking the path alongside of him. And it was, it was a real turning point in my, in my life as a printmaker. And I produced a lot of work after that, after that moment. Turned out to be good chemistry. <laughs> oh yeah, real good chemistry. I actually, to this day, use a Dutch mordant to do all my etching. Um, I have to ask you. You, you said that uh, he said that you had to go back to the United States and raise the money. Oh yeah. That doesn't sound like a small feat. How did you do that? And that was that was that was the hardest thing that I ever did. I actually was looking through a file recently because I probably did. I probably wrote to every body that was a funding body out there asking to support me and I got I got more no's than I got yeses I got all no's actually because I didn't fit into a category that that was like you know possible and so I was working a job in New York City at for Walt Disney and I was working in a, a publishing and I remember telling the, the publishers there that I, I got this acceptance letter, that this is what I wanted to do. They thought that this was like the most amazing. They were so supportive. They thought that I, I, this was a must. I had to do this. And about, I'd say a month before I was supposed to go, 
And I was still in my mind believing that I was going to go, even though I didn't have the finances to do it. I was believing it. And I believed with all of my heart. And I was very close to my, my grandparents and my great grandparents and my great grandfather and my grandfather. I was fortunate enough to work with while I was in art school and I would come back to Pennsylvania and work in my grandfather's workshop. And my great grandfather, um, we became where I would make drawings and I would send them home and then he would make drawings and send them back to me. And I had come home one weekend and I, I was, I was given a, I, I felt like I was given a calling. Or I was giving a message and I, I decided I was going to make up this beautiful little parcel for my great grandfather and take it to him. And it was flowers from my mother's garden. It was um, chocolate, which he loved. And I put it in this, this old cigar box. And I, I told my mom, I feel, I feel this pull. I have to go see my great grandfather who we called grandpa. And I went to see him and I went, when I went to see him, he was, he was, he, he passed away with me. And as he passed away with me, and he was in his 90s, he was 94. And as he passed away with me, it was my first experience. I was in my 20s, my first experience of, of losing or, or death. And I realized that I had to now carry this to my grandfather and tell him that his father had, had passed away. And, and I did, I did this, this, this whole thing. And, um, the funeral happened. It was a beautiful experience. There was, there was fire, you know, gunfires going off. He was a, he was a veteran. He was a firefighter. He was a wood carver. He was, he was, he was loved by his community. He was loved as a, as a folk artist. And I then went back to my life in New York City and I, I found myself stumbling around and all of a sudden I, I'm at my Walt Disney job and, and my phone rings and I, and I pick up the phone and it's my grandmother. And my grandmother says to me, your grandfather would like to speak to you. Now I was, I was 26 years old, 26, 27. My grandfather never spoke on the phone. My grandmother did all the speaking on the phone, but my grandfather never spoke on the phone. So I had never had an experience of speaking on the phone with him. And he gets on the phone with me and he says to me, I understand that you have been given something that is um, very important to you. And that's an acceptance letter to go to England to do a master's degree in printmaking. And I said, yes, I said, I, I want to go. I want to do this so bad. I said, but I just, I don't really know how I'm going to figure this all out. And he said, you, you have touched all of our lives in so many ways. He said, your great grandfather um, has left an inheritance for me. And he said, I would like to give you some of that money to just get on that plane and go over there and, and do what you would like to do. And I, to this day, let's fast forward that before my grandfather passed away, he came to me and he said, you know, he said, you've been the greatest investment in all of our lives. And, and I was so touched by that. So, you know, it's like, it's like generations passing, you know, passing things on and, and moving, moving the needle and le letting things go forward. Like nothing in society was going to stop me from this acceptance letter was the most important thing to me in my life. And it was not easy going to England at all. At that time, it was the, you know, 90s. But boy, I really loved everyone that I got to work with. I, I loved the the personal improvement that came with all of that. I felt like an ambassador of my own country and how did I, how was I that privileged to, and I felt like I had the, the power of my family and my, foot, and my footsteps when it came that's, to making that's, art. That's a lovely story. I, I think you. that you've also received training in Germany and Portugal. Um, not so much. Well, not so much Germany and Portugal. The training really came from University College London at the Slade School. And then through that was Bartow had 
then retired after 40 years of printmaking and he loved working with his students. So he created a, a printmaking, a Tavira print workshop in Portugal where he was where he was from and he would invite students to come there. So I was privileged to go and work there with him after, after that, that experience at the Slade. And I then got introduced to his um, print, printmaking artist friend and who also had a gallery in Germany. And then I, you know, followed in those footsteps, footsteps through Barto to show at that gallery in Germany. And that was, that was wonderful. Fantastic. Melissa, we have to take a break here, but we okay. will be back in just Sounds a few good. seconds. Okay, thank you. Welcome back to On Topic, a part of Practical Healthy Living. Today, we're talking to Melissa Strausser. Uh, tell us, Melissa, you have a new addition to a series of works called Sight Unseen, Unspoken Mystery Art, prints or uh, mystery print subscription 2022, I think it is. Uh, can, can you describe what this series is and, and how it started and, and how could our audience become involved in this? Sure. Um, my... I was I was raised um, in a family setting where I was very close to my grandparents and to celebrate milestones, whether they're big or small, was something that they really aspired to in their lives. And as folk artists that they were, they really touched a lot of people's lives. And I thought um, I had an experience of within the past three years of losing both of them. And, and when my grandfather, when we lost him, I just, I, I just thought to myself, you know, I'm kind of looking up in the sky and I'm, I'm seeing clouds and I'm seeing, I kept images of the, the, the eagle kept coming into my mind and I would see them different things. And I just thought, what could I do that would that would bring a whole lot more meaning to um, and just be really meaningful to what I do? What could I do for others that would make me always remember my grandparents, make me always um, celebrate milestones? And I came up with something called the Mystery Print Subscription and the mystery print subscription, I'm in my third year of it. And it basically is, um, I'd like to think of it as an invitation to buy sight unseen art. So people who've never bought art before, they can afford 30 or $35 a month to get this very special piece of artwork in the mail. And I, I call it the unspoken and I, meaning, they're narrative art prints. They tell a story, and it's almost like unpuzzling. You're you're on un, you're unpuzzling a bigger picture. So at the end of the year, you you get a full artwork by Melissa Strasser, and it's a it's a print, but it's in twelve pieces, and so it's being put together month by month. And I just I I find it so fun to do this because there's there's certain people that have the, their personalities will just raise their hand right away and say, oh yes, I, I, I want to do this. This sounds so exciting. It's so fun to me. And there's other people that will just be like, there is no way possible on this planet that I could ever buy anything that I do not know what it looks like. And I just, I love this because it just, uh, it creates conversation. You know, it creates these conversations. Plus, it puts something in the mail 
that is is missing in our lives. Remember those handwritten letters that we would get? And I mean, I saved every single handwritten letter that has ever come my way. And they, they were the most precious things. And so it's kind of put that element back into it, but it's also um, a way for uh, people who are very seasoned collectors and then people who are amateurs, they don't, they've never bought a piece of artwork and it, and it, and it creates a, it's just a, it's a wonderful experience. It's a wonderful experience that I share this with my daughter as well, because she's part of the process of maybe packaging up the envelopes or, you know, looking at the print as I'm making it. And, and, and it also gives that that self-discovery or that way of people's natural emotions, they're almost getting the experience of what I get while I'm making it because they're getting that artwork in the mail through this mystery print subscription. And at the end, I'm seeing an image for the first time too. They're seeing it completed, but I am as well. So that's, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. And I'm so I'm so grateful that I can remember my grandparents in this way by by offering something like this. I, I think this is like a, a, a fascinating a way of, of marketing your art. It, it reminds me of the Harry Potter series. You know, you have this wonderful book. You know you're going to buy the next book because it, yeah. it's a body of, of, of yeah. literature. And, and this is kind of like a body of literature, only it's art. And you get it. You only have to wait till next month to get the next episode. Right. A wonderful thing. I believe that you've uh, written a book, Melissa. Can you tell us what's the name of the book and what is it about? Yes, sure, Alan. The name of my book is Folk Art and it's Generations of the Women Artists. So it is the Pennsylvania Traditions, the Art of Folk Art. And it is, I almost look upon it, it's the start of something else. And it also, I feel like it was a recipe book that I wrote for my eight-year-old daughter. And it is showing her the lineage of the women artists that um, are part of our family. And I'm fourth generation, which makes my daughter fifth generation. And this um, book, there's always a lot of attention given to the, the men in our family, the art in the arts, the over auction or, or, or whatnot. And I just thought, well, there has to be some kind of tradition that's placed upon the women because the women are the ones in our family who maybe made the choices for what was going to be sold as the artwork, or maybe made the choices for what shows were going to be made, made the choices for pretty much everything. So um, I did it as a as tribute after my grandmother passed. My grandmother was a centenarian. She was 100 years old, and we lost her in April. And I did it. Um, I, I did it because I had, a, when I was in England, I wrote a thesis or I did a, a master's on everyday art, which really had to do with kind of the, the fine art or the traditional and then those folk arts and kind of how you merge those two together through printmaking or frocked or, or what we know as the Pennsylvania German um, way of uh, what what was done at the Ephrata cloisters and through the martyr's mirror and the 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 lineage of the Mennonites and the Amish and whatnot. So this is like the start of what I could see going into maybe another book about everyday art or about the folk arts. And so I'm really I'm really pleased with it and I was really excited about it. And it's and it it it's it's sold a few copies so far and it's gone into some really great hands of people and I'm getting really wonderful feedback about it. So I'm really pleased. If people were interested in getting a copy, how, how would they go about doing that? Oh, they could just go to www.melissastrasserart.com and you can find it, I think, right on my, right on my page. Cool. To purchase it. Yeah. Oh, uh, what other projects are you currently working on? Oh, I have many projects. So the one project that's the most exciting is I'm I'm actually in the process of about to print the largest etching that I've ever done. And it's 45 inches by 30, 
yeah, 45 inches by 33 inches, something like that. It's on, um, it's a, an etching of, it's layering of trees. It's something I, I, I think about, I saw it's COVID or it's COVID. It's tomato or tomato. I kind of like look upon it like that. When you have a, when you have a crisis like we've had, you either become creative or you get crushed. And in, in my, I think it's 80% of psychology that like when something, when something tragic happens or there's a struggle or there's a crisis, uh, I get really creative. So my creativity got really put into this piece of metal and it, it is let the layerings of different trees. And it, it's kind of, I want to call it the tree gong, but on top of it, it, it'll play sound. The gong will play sound. It will be an etching. I call it a diptych, but it's a huge project because it, it, it involves not only just myself, it involves more people. There's somebody who needed to make the paper. There's by the name of Doug Zuka who makes this gorgeous handmade paper nearby. Then there's, I'll need, um, you know, extra sets of hands to lift it on and off of a printing press. And there's a lot involved. So that's one project and it's very near to completion. So my that's goal is- Absolutely fascinating. My goal is before the end of the year. And the other, the other project is that I, the mystery prints, we could go back to that mystery prints. I also, the mystery print subscription is its thing, but I offer these mystery prints because I'm creating a collection of the etchings that I've done over the years. And I have, uh, I've had a goal for a very long time to work with a collaborative printmaker. And so I will be getting the opportunity to work with somebody by the name of Phil Sanders, who is a collaborative print, print make, a master printmaker. And that having that opportunity is just, um, it's like the next, the next step for me. So I'm pretty excited about that. And then the third project that I have is when my daughter was born, I, um, I started something called the Young Printmakers Workshop, which was a workshop for um, early learning education in children to learn how to um, really how to make how how to make it's it's an art workshop, but really it's more than that. It's it's cognitive. It's it's um, it's math. It's science it's a little bit of everything and they're just absorbing it so my my daughter could now run these workshops on her own but my my goal for this is we're going to be printed up in um an, an encyclopedia by the man of bill by the name by the name of a man named bill ritchie who created he's in seattle and he created these miniature etching presses which i have one the mini half wood press and he's publishing us into his encyclopedia, the Young Printmaker Workshop. But my dream for that is to actually sell that off, that whole idea of those workshops for children, because it, it, teaches, it teaches children um, uh, about the first computer. It teaches them about, you know, printmaking teaches them about the sciences and the arts combined. And there's so much more involved in that. And... So that's, that's pretty exciting. And then the, the fourth project I have in mind, I mean, we could talk about two different worlds that we have going on right now. We have the metaverse and we have the universe. And the metaverse is so um, startling and earth shaking. And it is a, a virtual world that is gonna exist in the future. And to be part of that as an artist, I think that there could be some beta testing with really healing, healing laboratories where people can experience that. So that's something that through sound and art that I really um, have on my mind right now to think of about that in the future and have conversations with the right people of see if we could do something. So. Well, let's see, you, you, you are a creative force. Yeah. <laughs> I have to yeah. say. Um, I have to ask you though, what are your patients? Uh, we, we know that you love art, but what are your other passions in your life that, that make you Melissa Strauss? 
My number one passion in my life um, is being a mother. I think that it is the most challenging, beautiful experience that I feel so blessed with every single day. And so that is my greatest passion. My, of course, I have a, a, a tremendous love for art. Um, I have an empathy for humankind and that has developed over the years. And I think that life is just, should just be so highly valued. I think this is a, such an amazing place where we are. And I think that to serve others and to be a servant to others is, um, you know, it's a selfless activity. And it's something that I, I've, I've, I've done um, my own self-discovery of, you know, when you when you do acts of caregiving or you do acts of of even being an artist you're it's a selfless it's selfless you know you're you're giving so much of yourself because we need to have these conversations people need to have conversations people can heal one another people can people can make a difference in other people's lives and that's very important my one of my one of my greatest passions and it's something that i really stuck to my whole life and that is personal development or personal improvement. And I have some um, masters that I like to follow. I have, uh, I'm fortunate to have coach Joe Orangio in my life as a strength training, strength training coach. I have uh, strength training is my passion. It, it gets my mind moving in the right directions. It, the movement of the body is very important to me. Um, I think people like Tony Robbins and Dean Grazioso and all these, all these masters, Shalene Johnson, Jenna Kutcher, I, I listen to these, these people and my newfound favorite passion is marketing because I, as an artist, I don't think I even understood what that word even meant. And so so I study marketing now and I, I, I try to learn as much about it as I possibly can, because I think that it's such, it's such an invitation to invite people into your world to, to be able to, you know, have this financial freedom of, of exchanging what you do in, in, in exchange for monetizing or, you know, earning a living. And as a mother, that's, that's very important to me to take care of my my child the best that I can. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you, you've, um, today, I'm in Indiana, and you are in Pennsylvania. The world's yeah. getting smaller in, in so many ways, and yeah. yet somehow the distance between everyone seems to grow. Uh, you have had influences from England and Germany and Portugal, you said, mm -hmm. and then also influences as, as a Pennsylvania uh, tradition of folk art how do you at this point describe what a local artist is oh well I, I love that question because for me a local artist could be a teacher teaching art to your child at school that could be a local artist a local artist could also be somebody who works within healthcare and is um offering you know art therapy classes for patients who need healing in many different areas that's a local artist a local artist is somebody who really um i think dives into their community and experiences the culture and gives back to that community so that that those are those are just few of my definitions of a local artist Thank you. I, I want to thank you for joining us today on Practical Healthy Living, and I do hope you'll come back and join us again soon. Thank you so much, Alan, for having me.
Well, the holiday is coming up. If you think about it, though, a holiday is always coming up. Want to avoid holiday conflicts with family and friends? Take control of the process. Over the past few years, my team and I have gathered data on where people learn their values. This is important because holiday and family conflicts often emerge as a result in a clash of values. Our work shows five clusters of learned values centering around specific categories of influencers. These include families, peers, religion, school, and mass media. Or as one researcher described it, parents, peers, preachers, principals, and the press. Most conflicts can be traced back to conflicts between and among these clusters. When families gather, the individuals who seem to be least affected by conflict are those who have come to terms with these influencing clusters and have developed a stable internal set of core values. It also helps if they have come with a big game plan. In these days of COVID, families may even argue about whether or not the family should gather in the first place. They have conflicts over whether or not, if you gather, should everyone be wearing masks? For example, such conflicts may stem from family values for education and, say, religion. The value for education may have led to a degree in nursing with a belief that we have to take these variants serious. This value may be pitted against a religious value that people should commune and a belief that God will guide and protect us. These values are compatible. It might lead to a happy Thanksgiving Zoom dinner for a second year in a row. If they're not in sync, however, families might argue why someone did not attend the family function and whether they think they're better than us. To reduce family conflicts, first know what your values are and where the rubs will occur with others. You can take charge of gathering if you host by controlling the invite list and setting the ground rules. You can also take charge of a situation if you're not hosting by deciding in advance what your tolerance level is for conflict and having an appropriate escape plan. Better to plan for possible conflicts and have contingencies at the ready rather than hoping conflicts don't occur. A lot of magical thinking occurs around the holidays. This holiday, everyone will gather and, and just have a wonderful time, right? Yeah, right. In reality, you're mixing a divergent cast of characters with alcohol and the need to release a lot of built-up tension. Yeah, there could be some conflict. Rather than believing everyone will just somehow get along this year, have a strategy. Hopefully one that goes beyond, just don't talk about politics or religion. In my private practice, I have found there are no absolutely safe topics of discussion because every topic can get pulled into one category of values or another. To paraphrase a common idiom, topics don't cause conflict, people do. Another thing I've found is that people tend not to experience higher levels of conflict if they feel their needs are met. So don't hesitate to ask your guests ahead of time, what do you need in order to have a happy and successful visit to my house? If you can provide what they seek, great, it should be a good time. If they start to engage in conflict, you can then remind them that their stated needs have been met, so stand down. If you can't provide what they need, don't hesitate to say, yeah, maybe you better sit this one out. You and I can catch up with a longer call just after the holiday. It will give us something to look forward to after the holidays subside. Finally, a conflict management plan is a wise tool to have at the ready. This can be as simple as knowing how to diffuse a conflict as it emerges. People do not like to think of themselves as angry, unreasonable, or out of control. When you hear tension starting to flare up through conversation between your guests, ask the angriest sounding person, John, are you upset? You sound angry about something. Our instincts are to deny our anger and to immediately start self-monitoring when our angry behavior is brought to our attention. By doing this, one simple thing, the temperature in the room should automatically start to subside if you catch it early. On the other hand, you cannot have a tango without a dance partner so beware the other person doing or saying something, especially on a passive aggressive level, that could get John going again. It is best to separate potential hazards like water and electricity or heat and combustibles or John and cousin Lily. When John says, no, I, I'm, I'm not angry. Or even if in the rare instance where he might say, yeah, I'm getting pretty worked up here. Just say, good, then you can help me in the kitchen, please, with the turkey or some other task. Other strategies are to turn down the alcohol and to turn up the football. Alcohol impairs judgment, so it should be monitored. Sports are all about conflict. 
but there are typically prescribed and socially accepted avenues for that conflict to be expressed and processed. Try as one might to plan for a great holiday gathering, there are times when a conflict will occur that just cannot be avoided. This is where you need to have identified in advance the level of distress above which you're not willing to tolerate. You also need to have a strategy for separating warring parties. For example, someone to separate the guests, someone to mollify each offended person, someone to escort offending parties to their car if you need. These people need to know their roles ahead of time. If you have contingency plans in place, you're less likely to experience big conflicts in the first place. If they occur, however, you will have your strategy in place to manage it. So have a party, and God bless us all, everyone. And that does it for us this week at Practical Healthy Living. Sincerely, thank you for tuning in. Please join us again next week as we explore the ever-changing world around us. Until then, stay well, and keep exploring through the power of Practical Healthy Living.